Uh, Representative Thompson, would you like to make a motion to move House File 786 to be before the committee and to lay it over for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date? Maybe not. Uh, Representative Feist, would you be so kind as to uh, make that motion? Yeah, so moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Feist. Uh, Chair, member, uh, excuse me, members of the committee and members of the public who are looking to lay this over this bill over by 11:55 a.m. As as those who are here regularly know, we have hard stops uh, given the technology and the demands on the House Public Information uh, Department. Representative Lee, welcome to the committee. Please proceed with uh, your bill introduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Feist, for uh, moving my bill. Uh, House File 786 is a statewide initiative supported by many organizations that work together through the state's after-school network called Ignite After School. Uh, the purpose of House File 786 is to make permanent the state's commitment to high-quality after-school programs. In the bill, there is an unspecified specify amount each year for competitive grants for after school community learning programs that have the following objectives uh, to increase uh, access to protective factors that build young people's capacity to be product productive adults uh, developing skills and behaviors necessary to succeed in post-secondary education or career opportunities and encouraging school attendance and improving, uh, improving academic performance uh, the bill also specified that grants should be awarded to programs that primarily serve students eligible for free and reduced price meals and provide opportunities for academic enrichment and other services activities to meet program objectives. And the grants also required to uh, be awarded equitably among the geographic areas of the state without giving preference to any particular grade. Uh, the bill also requires the Department of Education to monitor and evaluate grant recipient performance and effectiveness and meeting the program objectives. And with me today, Mr. Chair, are uh, testifiers who have been working uh, to accomplish this for several years. Fantastic, thank you, Representative Lee. Uh, I understand that the first uh, testifier on my list is Ms. Dennison Kaneen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Welcome to uh, the committee, good to see you again. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dabney, members of the committee. My name is Carrie Dennison Kaneen, and I am the Executive Director of Ignite After School. We are Minnesota's statewide after school network, um, and we're an intermediary organization. So we don't directly provide after school programs, but instead, uh, we bring together all the different kinds of organizations that do, from community education and schools to parks and libraries, as well as many small and large nonprofits like the YMCA uh, network in the state, as well as Boys and Girls Club. Um, our primary aim at Ignite is to close race, income, and geography-based access gaps to after-school and summer learning. Um, we do this through partnership building. And then our other aim is really to focus on quality. Uh, and so we do a lot of professional development, as well as leading the continuous program improvement process for after-school programs around the state. And I am very uh, excited to be here with you today to talk in support of House File 786, which does establish a competitive grant program to fund really comprehensive, well-designed, high-quality after-school and summer learning opportunities for uh, students in K through 12th grade. Um, and uh, Representative Lee covered the three primary aims of the grant, um, but I do want to stress again, um, some of those key aims and their importance. So the first one being to really center youth and adult partnerships and relationships. So uh, a real important piece of young people being successful in school, but also in, in life is to really have access to caring adults to build relationships there. We know that when young people have those kinds of relationships, they do better in school and they also stay away from risky behaviors. Um, we also know that after school programs can be a big part of helping young people build sort of 21st century skills or um, those social emotional learning skills that are important for post secondary and career opportunities. And after school also plays a role in supporting uh, better attendance in school and academic performance. 
Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what we mean at Ignite when we talk about after school and summer learning in case you're like, what are, what is this though? Um, so there's a couple really, in, um, I think important things to note about what is a high quality after school and summer learning. Um, one, it really does center relationships. Um, so it is when we train youth workers, we're talking about what is the positive relationship you're building with young people. Another is it's really about choice and youth voice. So we're looking at young people being a part of, you know, what kinds of learning opportunities they want to be having. Um, so that's really important. The other piece is that the learning is often hands-on, project-based, um, it's engaged learning. So we're really looking for um, things like, I'm gonna give you some examples, like community gardens, service learning, um, you know, building robots, so really hands-on STEM learning. Um, and another piece is that high quality after school really pairs team building and recreation with this sort of content-based learning. High quality after school and summer learning, it complements formal school day learning, but it doesn't replicate it. So I also wanted to share a little bit of research about after school programs. And I have been at this committee for many years and shared a lot of research, but this is new research that I'm very excited about. Um, so this is the study of early care and youth development and papers are just coming out. It's the first study of its kind because it's longitudinal. So it's looking, it followed about 1300 young people from birth to age 26. And they're just starting to produce papers on sort of, you know, asking questions of this data set. So one thing that's unique is that it looked at early learning and after school and summer learning. And what we're find, what it found is that regular participation in uh, after school and summer learning in the elementary grades resulted in higher math and reading test scores at age 15. So in that ninth grade transition period. Um, they also looked at whether or not this made any difference, whether you were a low income student or a middle or upper income student. And what they found is that it had greater gains. So if you are a low income student, you have greater gains in a GPA in ninth grade than a middle and um, upper income student would have. So what that tells us is that after school and summer learning is particularly important for low income students when we're looking at outcomes. Um, some other things that they're looking at out of this data set is around, um, well, they looked at middle and high school students and their participation in after school and found that it could act as a protective factor against substance abuse up to age 26. The study stopped at age 26, so hopefully it continues to have protective factors beyond that, but that we don't know beyond age 26. Um, and the, I think this research really demonstrates that after school programs can have a broad range of impacts from both academics to building 21st century skills to decrease, decreasing risky behavior. Um, but it's also important to note that in Minnesota, after school participation has been, is, is going down. Um, and that is really, um, I think, problematic given the positive impacts that these programs have. So when we look at America after 3 p.m. Um, survey results, so America after 3 is a national parent survey. It's been conducted since 2004. And in 2020, the results for the very first time since um, 2004 uh, look at participation is going down. So from 2004 to 2014, participation was going up in after school. And then in 2020, we started to see that number of participation in Minnesota go down. Um, also, for every one young person in an after school program in Minnesota, the, the research found that there's three parents who are saying they want their child to participate and don't have access. Um, this data is also borne out by Minnesota student survey data from 2016. So we disaggregated um, Minnesota student survey data by race and income uh, in seven different regions around the state and found that uh, white students and upper income students participate at a greater rate than low income students and students of color. Um, the, and then I also just want to share um, that in Minnesota, there's the 21st Century Community Le Learning Center program. This is a federally funded grant program administered by MDE, and it does support these kinds of programs, but they're only able to fund one third of the applications they receive. So this really demonstrates that there's high demand for these opportunities from districts and community-based organizations across the state, and there just are not the resources to make sure that kids have access. Um, 
We really believe that House File 786 and the After School Community Learning Grant Program is really going to help to close this gap across the state. Uh, Representative Lee shared, and I'll, I'll just uh, say again, that the bill has been designed to make sure that all types of after school programs can apply. This is really important because every community across the state looks different, has different kinds of organizations. So we want to make sure that um, every different community who's interested can apply and can pull together the partnership of organizations that make sense. It also will work in rural, suburban, large and small cities. We've seen that through 21st century and the bill requires that equitable distribution, focuses on students receiving free and reduced price lunch. Um, and it also uh, provides an opportunity for uh, grant recipients to participate in professional development and continuous program improvement. The research I talked about earlier, that only happens when the program's high quality. So we wanna make sure we focus there. Um, we know that during this pandemic, young people and families have experienced a lot of stressors. And we really believe that now more than ever, these kinds of learning opportunities are really going to be important to help us um, support young people's uh, mental well being, their social well being, as well as their academic success. So, on behalf of Ignite After School and our broad uh, network across the state. I want to thank you so much for your time and um, thank you for your consideration of House File 786. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dennison Um uh, Members, just uh, tracking, uh, Representative Jordan has been excused uh, for from today's hearing. Representative Daniels has joined us. So uh, thank you for that. We have a question from Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Ali, uh, I noticed that in line 3.21 and, and then again in line 0.323, that there are two uh, takings by the Department of Education for administration. Uh, the first one, as I said, no, I didn't say this, but the first one is for 2% for administration. The second one is for 5%, and that's for monitoring and assistance. Have you had a discussion with the department to find out exactly uh, why they need these two different uh, takings from uh, your proposal for uh, administration? Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you mm -hmm. for the question, Representative Erickson. I have not had this conversation with uh, the Department of Education, but as the bill is being laid over, we can have this uh, conversation and get back to the committee. I don't know if Ms. Uh, Dennison Kunin have anything else to add on this. Ms. Dennison Kunin, do you have anything? Chair Davney, Representative Erickson. Um, yes, uh, so the 2% is really just to uh, build and lead the grant competition itself. So to run the grant competition. And then as I stated, um, high quality is really important. So the 5% is to provide continuous program improvement supports and professional development to grantees. Um, this is done with 21st century programs and um, I didn't bring it today, but I can share some of the results of 21st century programs if folks are interested. But we really believe that those outcomes cannot be achieved without the supports necessary um, to work on quality improvement and high quality effective practices of programs. And so that's what they would be providing with those resources. Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, you know, it's a bit steep uh, besides, uh, you know, Ignite is going to get a 2.5% set aside for technical assistance. So, you know, I don't know what's happened in the past, but I have observed some after school programs in Minnesota and also out of state. And I find the one that I visited in Denver about four, four years ago was highly structured, had lots of accountability, and the children really thrived. You know, they had uh, after school, they had their snack time, they had their relaxation time, they had some library time, and then they were led into their structured settings. They had assistance with their academics, uh, which I observed and it was just uh, top of the line. And then they had their skills uh, and their relationship building. And it lasted till 6 p.m. And then the buses uh, took the children to their uh, homes or wherever they were to be delivered. And it was highly effective. But when I visited a couple programs in Minnesota, 
I found that they were very loosely organized. And I'm not talking about those from Ignite, because I know the one uh, in Representative Cretia's district has done very well. Uh, but I, I just saw a lot of unstructure. And, uh, and I'm hoping that if this proposal goes forward, that there's actually going to be some teeth behind the accountability that needs to occur, especially now with an achievement gap that's growing, so that the children do get a chance to close the achievement gap through this after school program because they're getting uh, extra attention in the areas where they might be behind. Uh, so, you know, those are questions that I have, and I think it's really important that if the department is going to call for this takings from this proposal, that they really are staying on top of things to ensure that our children are getting the most out of these programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Dennison, can you want to respond to uh, some of the, the structures that you have in place, the continuous improvement work you referenced? Expand on that a little bit for the committee to understand better. Yes, thank you, Chair Davney and Representative Erickson. Uh, Representative Erickson, the program that you described from another state um, sounds exactly like what we're talking about in this bill. It's also very similar to a lot of the programs that you'll see in 21st century. And I do believe we have another testifier and, and she could also attest to this and share what that looks like. Um, but I will say that um, in, in Representative Kresha's di district, that's a 21st century funded program. And so they are required to participate in continuous program improvement utilize assessments, uh, go through training. And I think that is what makes for a really high quality program. And that is why um, we have intentionally included those supports in this bill. Um, I also just wanna clarify that my, I believe in the bill, the 2.5% for Ignite the up to is part of the 5% for MDE and not in addition to. Um, and that's because Ignite operates the continuous program improvement process. Um, and we do that um, in partnership with MDE for the 21st century. Uh, grantees. Thank you, Ms. Dennison Kaneen. Uh, I have uh, Representative Lee, a Buddy King on the list uh, from the YMCA Beacons program, but I understand that uh, he had some schedule issues and is not able to attend. But there might be a statement of his. Ms. Dennison Kaneen, you look like I caught your interest. Yes, thank you, Chair Daphne. Um, we have two testifiers in addition to myself, uh, Jenny from Beacons, and then we also had uh, Buddy King, who is a pastor. He had to proceed over a funeral this morning and was unable to attend. He did have uh, written testimony, and I would love to be able to read that on his behalf, Chair. If, if you would, and then uh, Ms. Wright Collins, uh, you're on deck since... Uh... The Twins training camp is opened. I can go back to baseball references. Thank you, Ms. Dennison Kaneen. Please proceed with reading Mr. Uh, King's statement, Reverend King's statement. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Buddy King, and I am a father of five and a current first grader in a local elementary school in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I would like to take a moment and share with you the importance of after school enrichment programs. Being a community leader, a former director of an after school organization, and having my children, who are at least six years apart, has given me the personal assurance of these activities. My experiences and consistent push of these programs short showed 43% improvement mixed with a number of other variables, such as outside family support, conflict resolution skills, time management, teamwork, selflessness, and implementation of the golden rule to treat others how you want to be treated. Data shows that out of school activities present children with several skills they learn to master. Most of my time as a parent with my first child was really reacting and surviving. By child three, we quickly realized that improvements our children were beginning to make was because of their outside activities. We noticed the friendships that were beginning to take place that normally they would not have been exposed to. We are a close knit family, a very large family. So it was nice to see them expand their cultural awareness. 2020 has taught us a lot of things. Most importantly, it taught us that learning happens more than just in the classroom. 21st century students have a hold on technology completely different than we did as children. These students utilize this platform for everything, but the one thing it will never be able to replace is SEL or social emotional learning. As human beings, we all yearn for an interaction with others on some level and the ability to interact with other students on a non-academic platform is powerful. 
Many educators and other nonprofit organizations have mastered the idea of learning with a purpose. Learning with a purpose is when you take an activity that children already do, such as pool. The game of pool is quite entertaining, and the concept of the game is basic geometry. Utilizing the same theories, you take these concepts and make it practical fun. Depending on the level of the student would determine the level of deepness required. And I have seen students personally do better in math because of these activities, again, like dominoes or monopoly. I could give more examples of everyday activities that could be used to enrich our students outside the classroom, but would run out of time. In conclusion, you, the elected representatives of the people, have the great pleasure and privilege to assure that all Minnesotans, no matter of race, creed, socioeconomic status, have every opportunity to receive the best educational experience possible. It's also important that we remember that learning does not just happen in the classroom. Learning happens whenever the eyes are open and the senses are taking in information. We have an achievement gap in the state between white children and children of color. We all wanna see this, cap, this gap decreased. There are a variety of programs helping to address this all over the state. CBOs across the state, such as Ignite, Higher Works Collaborative, and United Ways work tirelessly day in and day out to fulfill their mission of making sure every child has an opportunity to be successful in life. I leave you with this quote from Rashid Agunlara. Some strive to make themselves great. Others help, other, others help others see and find their own greatness. It's the latter who really enriches the world we live in. Thank you, Chair and Committee, for the time. Thank you, Ms. Dennison Kaneen. Uh, Ms. Wright Collins, welcome to the committee. Thank you for uh, your time today. Please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Dabney and members of the committee. My name is Jenny Collins. I'm an executive director with the, Be the Beacons Network and the YMCA of the North. I'm pleased to be here today uh, to speak on behalf of YMCAs and our youth development partners um, all around the state who are really committed to positive youth development. Um, I, I want to just pause and invite, respectfully invite each of you to take a breath and to picture a young person in your life, maybe someone in your family, maybe someone in your neighborhood, and to think about that young person, that child or that teenager, uh, and to think about a hope you have for them as they navigate the challenges we're currently navigating as a state. Um, and then to think about a milestone you're looking forward to for that young person, a hope you have, maybe five years, 10 years down the line. And I start that way because I think our opportunity right now is to take those hopes we each carry for our own kids, the kids in our families and neighborhoods, and extend those hopes to every young learner in Minnesota. Um, and I'm so proud to be a part of the community of after school program and youth development uh, agencies that partner with our schools and neighborhoods to close gaps and opportunity for young people. Um, I often describe uh, an invisible curriculum that we have our visible curriculum and then we have this invisible curriculum of learning and development opportunities where young people access relationships and enrichment opportunities like Carrie described, whether those be sports or art or leadership programs. Um, and we have such a powerful opportunity uh, through this funding to expand the access that young people have um, to really unleash their potential in our state. So I thank you for taking the time for that. Um, and I hope you'll carry those hopes with you through this, um, this next couple moments. Um, so our Beacons Network serves about 5,000 young Minnesota learners um, each year. We are currently in Minneapolis and Richfield in 16 schools, working with students kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, but our partners are broad and wide and both through Beacons and through their youth development agencies um, are serving across the state. So Beacons is unique because we're a collaborative partnership between the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the YWCA, community education, and, and school districts and schools across our communities. And together we partner with young people and their families to close these gaps and opportunity. Um, we provide high quality after school and summer programming that accelerates learning through enrichment and partners with low income youth and families to create equitable schools and communities. Um, in response to this last year, we've partnered with our schools and agencies to provide wraparound support with low income families 
And we've continued to engage our youth as change makers in responding to the emerging needs in our communities. One young person that I'd love to lift up, uh, there's 5,000 plus stories, but I'll, I'll lift up one. Uh, her name is Javana Grimes, and Javana is actually featured right now on the After School Alliance's website uh, nationally. And she shares her perspective on youth voice and the importance of her after school staff in her life. Um, but we're so proud to have seen how Javana navigated the personal, significant personal challenges in this last year. Um, but despite those challenges and barriers, she continued on her educational path. She completed high school. Um, and at the same time, she reached out to create more opportunities for other youth. So working through our Beacons After School program, um, she created socially distanced, safe pop-up events for other young people in local parks in partnership with our parks, schools, and agencies. Um, she also, in addition to combating social isolation for teens in our community, um, she also made sure that she was on track for high school completion and enrolled for post-secondary. Um, so she's such a great example of how our young people are resilient um, and they have, uh, they have the solutions to the challenges that we currently face and their voices need to be a part of those solutions. Um, so we know that these kinds of partnerships and programs produce significant outcomes for young people, both academic and social. Just to highlight a couple that we've seen across our Beacons Network, we completed a five-year longitudinal evaluation. Uh, this was at Minneapolis Public Schools and found that 91% of Beacons youth graduated on time, significantly higher population than their peers. Um, we also found Beacons youth attended school one week more than their peers. Uh, their participation rates dramatically impacted behavioral, refer behavioral referrals in school. Um, and all of this happened despite serving the highest needs schools um, and young people who um, are, are from low income communities with 84% uh, on free and reduced lunch compared to 50% in the district. We also know that 20% of our young people receive uh, early uh, special education services and 34% are English language learners. So really um, representing the, the rich diversity of our young people uh, in Minneapolis and also seeing great outcomes in terms of their academic performance. Um, and we know that these results happen not by accident, but because they're grounded in high quality youth development practices. Um, and key strategies we use include developmental relationships, promoting youth voice and choice, and providing culturally responsive programming and staff. These strategies increase students' connection to school, their sense of belonging, and uh, increase their sense of voice. So the Search Institute describes developmental relationships as having five key components. And we really see these exemplified in Beacons and other youth development programs. That our staff express care, challenge growth, provide support, share power, and expand possibilities. Uh, we also know that it's critical for youth to have staff in programs that are highly trained and also represent their racial and cultural background and lived experience. Um, and we prioritize hiring from the communities where young people live. So in fact, 25% of our program staff are alumni of the program. We have uh, alumni uh, in other esteemed roles in the community as well as evidenced by Representative Lee. Uh, so shout out to Representative Lee. Um, and we also know that uh, amongst our staff, uh, not only are we intentionally putting into place culturally responsive programming, but we're also representing um, the cultures of our, uh, that our young people bring, that our young people bring. 75% um, of our team members identify as people of color. Uh, we also center youth voice and choice in the programming, and we know that builds social emotional capacities of our young people. So 90% of our participants say there's an adult at Beacons who helps when the young people have a problem. 80% say they get to do things that help people in their communities. And 96% of participants say that coming to Beacons has helped them find out what they're good at doing and what they like to do. So we're so proud of these results um, and we're so grateful for your consideration of uh, expanding funding to these critical supports for young people. We know that youth workers and youth development organizations play an important role in developing social emotional capacities, um, bridging between schools and community and really engaging young people ultimately to participate in our democracy. 
Um, I want to um, thank you, and I want to close with the words of, uh, to go back to Giovanna. Um, her words on the After School Alliance website, she shares, include my feedback, we want to be heard. And so I thank you for hearing uh, from me on behalf of our young people and families and encourage us to continue to lift up opportunities for youth, especially those that lift up their voices. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Uh, members and members of the public, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. Uh, we received no requests from the public to testify. Uh, at this point, Representative Lee, I see no other uh, member questions. Do you have any closing comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for the opportunity to present this. And just a quick comment to uh, uh, one of the statements that was made earlier about the MDE, Minnesota Department of Education, taking a uh, piece of this for the grant administration. Just want to uh, reemphasize to the mem members of the committee that this is for uh, evaluating the uh, program recipients to make sure that they are meeting the objectives that we have laid out in the bill. And so this is a proposal that I brought forth uh, with uh, the work of the Ignite uh, After School Network. And this is not an MDE proposal. And so I just want to put that on the record, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to present. Thank you, Representative Lee. With that, Representative Feist renews her motion that House File 786 be laid over for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date. Ms. Dennison-Kaneen, Ms. Collins, thank you much for uh, your testimony today. Representative Lee, thank you.